Bokir Tov. We are uh, continuing our study of the Amida. We're in the third and final section, the section of Hoda'a, the section of gratitude, thanks, and appreciation for Hashem. We did the first of the three Berachot in this section, Avoda, the Berachah talking about the service and our ability to present Hashem with offerings that he'll accept. Today we had present him with tefillot and we get the opportunity to have an audience with him. We now move to the second of those Berachot, which is perhaps the essential crux of the section, the Modim prayer, where we bow to Hashem and we give thanks for all of the great things that Hashem does. We'll read the Beracha. We'll talk about some of the themes within this Beracha, which will be readily apparent when we read it. Modim anachnulah. We are grateful to you, Sha'atahu Hashem elokenu, that you are the Lord our God, velokeavutenu, and the God of our forefathers, le'olam va'ed, for now and forever and for all eternity. Surenu tzur hayenu, you are our tzur. Tzur is, means a rock. In other words, you're that which we lean on, that which supports us. Surenu tzur hayenu, you're the rock, the rock of our lives. Umagen yishainu atahu, and you are the protector of our salvation. Atahu, that's who you are. Some people read this like that, the way I read it with the comma, and then they continue. Ledor vador no generation after generation, we shall admit to you and thank you. And we will speak of your praise and your glory. For our lives that are given into your hands. In other words, as we say in our Bidkota Shahar, we don't take for granted the fact that we live and we wake up every single morning. Um, rather, our lives are in Hashem's hands. Whenever Hashem decides to take a person's life from them, whenever she lived to 120, that's what is determined. So we recognize that while uh, we think even with medicine and everything that we have, that we have the ability to control so much, and Baruch Hashem with Hashem, that we have the ability to cure and to heal, that he's given us that ability. In the end of the day, all of that is given into the hands of Hashem. For our lives that are given over to your hands. And for our nishamot, our souls, that are pekudot lach. The word pekudot means that are like... Um, when a person gives somebody an object to watch for them, right? Let's say you're going away on vacation and you want your neighbor to take care of your pet or something. You're giving your pet to them as a picadon, something for them to look over, to watch over. So our nishamot are pekudot lach. Our nishamot are in the hands of Hashem. They're being watched over by God. Every night when we go to sleep, HaKadosh Baruch Hu cleanses and takes and watches over us to give us back and restore our nishamot the following morning. And so our nishamot are pikudot lach. They are given as a pikadon, as a as a as a as something to watch over in the hands of Hashem. And on the miracles that you perform for us with every every single day, right through nature. And on the wonders and goodnesses that you perform for us at all moments, evening, morning, and afternoon. Notice that order, obviously, Erev starting in the night, because we know the day starts in the night. This is an allusion to what David HaMelech said, Erev Evening, morning, and afternoon, Asiha, I will converse with God, and Hashem will listen to my voice. That's an allusion to the fact that we pray three times a day, beginning in the night, Arbit, in the morning, Shaharit, and in the afternoon, Minha. The fact that we have to consistently throughout our day, every time our day shifts, grant, you know, give all thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and acknowledge Hashem is an essential part of a Jew's life. Uh, at night, we give thanks to Hashem and we pray to Hashem for taking care of us. In the morning, for restoring us. In the afternoon, for allowing us to continue through the day. So we never take any part of our day, any experience that we have, for granted. Hatov kilo hamecha. The good that you do for your mercy never runs out. Hamerahem, you are the compassionate one. Kilotamu hasadecha, for your kindness never concludes. Kimeolam, kivinulach. Forever we have hope and tikva. Kivinu from the word tikva, we have hope in you. I'll continue just to the beracha part. At this point, if it were uh, if it were Hanukkah or Purim, we would add in an Al Hanisim prayer special to that day, which we've done when we've done the holiday prayers. The al kulam upon all of these, meaning all of the great things, the wonders, the miracles, the constant vigilance that Hashem gives to us. Yit barach, you're blessed. Yit romam, you're exalted. Yit naseh, and you're uplifted. You hear shades of the kaddish that we say over here. 
Tamid, consistently, Shimcha Malkenu, the name and your kingdom, Le'olam Va'ed, for all eternity. Ve'chol ha'chayim yodu chasela. All of those who are alive, yodu chasela, will give uh, 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 admission and thanks to Hashem for all time. Uh, an interesting little allusion over here, the words Ve'chol ha'chayim yodu chasela, the word ha'chayim, the rabbis have a nice rim, is a nice hint to that. The word Hayim has four letters, Het, Yud, Yud, Mem. The rabbis say these four letters correspond to the four reasons that a person would make Birkata Gomem, which is another Beracha, which is about uh, giving thanks to Hashem for helping a person through a turbulent time. Het, Yud, Yud, Mem. What does it stand for? Het stands for? Huh? No, so let's do the Yud. I always forget how, how it works. What? One is Yam, uh, the other is Yisurim. So Yam means uh, going over the ocean. The other Yud is Yisurim. The Mem is Midbar, right? It's going for a desert. And what's the fourth one? Yam, Yisurim, Midbar. Yisurim is for a Holes, for someone who's sick. Why am I forgetting? Tov. See, that's why you forget. Huh? Yisurim is when a person is sick. Yam is when he goes over water. Havush, correct. Hayat stands for Havush, when a person is incarcerated and he goes out. So the Chol Hayim Yodu Chasela. Anybody who has these four experiences, which are hinted to in the word Hayim, Yodu Chasela. They'll give thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But in, in this line is a very important idea. The idea that a person can only give gratitude to, and thanks to Hashem when he's alive. David HaMelech says this in the Halel. He says, Lo Those who are dead cannot, yeah, they cannot give praise to Hashem. Only when someone is alive. This is why as human beings, as I mentioned on Shabbat, we appreciate life. We always want to be alive because when we're alive, we could bring awareness to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We could praise Hashem. We can thank Him for all the things that we do. Once a person, Lo Aleinu, has passed on, <clears throat> that's the end of it. So David HaMelech tells Hashem, Hashem, help me through this situation Help me get over a potentially life-threatening situation so that I can give thanks to you, that I can spread awareness to you for, uh, for, for other people. That's why the rabbis say, if a person ever gets into a situation where their uh, life is in danger, they should immediately make a vow, they should make a neder, that if a person is going to, ex to have salvation from this, that they will exalt the name of Hashem, that they'll make a seudat hoda'a, that they'll tell everybody the story, that they'll study Torah, and they'll publicize the miracle that Hashem did. Because the idea is, is that Hashem will help a person through a difficult time and keep them alive if it means that that, that person will promote the name of Hashem to other people and spread awareness of God. That's v'chol ha'chaim yodu chasela. V'chalelu, therefore we will praise, v'varechu, we'll bless, et shimcha ha'gadol, your great name, be'emet, with truth, le'olam, for all eternity, kitov, because it's good. Ha'el yeshu'atenu ve'ezratenu sela, the God who gives our salvation and our assistance for all time. Ha'el ha'tov, the good God. Recognition, you can hear that the word tov is a consistent word that is repeating itself in this beracha, the recognition that everything that comes to us in this world is all for our good. It's all tov. There's no such thing as ra, as ber, coming from the sky, coming from the heavens to, to us. Even when things appear to be bad, we always have to understand that it is for our benefit. Sometimes it means that we have to be better. We have to refine ourselves. We have to do teshuvah. But no matter what happens, everything is from the tov. We're constantly mentioning the idea of tov. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you God. Hatov shimcha ulcha na'e lehodot. Your name and you are befitting to give thanks. The good and your name and you are befitting to give thanks. So, if we had to really break down the beracha, I mean, it's its themes are pretty self-evident. The fact that we're giving, we're admitting that Hashem does so much for us. We're thanking Hashem for all of the good things that He does for us. We're recognizing that everything that comes to us is good. But we also notice the ideas that our lives are placed in Hashem's hands. Nothing happens without Hashem deciding that it's going to be that case. And I think a powerful idea is the idea of al nisecha shebechol yom imanu. For the miracles that happen every single day. And on the wonders and good that happens at all times. It's so easy for us to only look at the miraculous events or when something goes wrong and we see the Yad Hashem. Every one of us has those experiences from time to time where we see that things were just orchestrated by God. And you have 
a moment where you're connected to Hashem. But then in between those periods, there's sort of a, uh, you know, a lull, I guess you could say, right? We experience a great high, and then we go back to everyday life. We go back to the, to the grind, as they say. And it's very easy then to lose sight <clears throat> of the fact that Hashem is still assisting us and still taking care of us during those interim periods. I once heard a nice mashal, where David Foreman says, he once took a trip to like the Midwest, right? He says, it's like driving through Nebraska, right? He goes, you're driving through Nebraska, all you see is cornfields. There's cornfield, field, field, field. Okay, then all of a sudden you'll see like one like spectacular thing and then like for another hour, just cornfield, cornfield, cornfield. He goes, what do we tend to notice, right? We tend to notice all of those special things that pop out at us, right? But the drive through the, you know, the cornfields, all right, you've seen one, you've seen them all, right? Uh, if you think about it, our lives, we tend to do that as well. What do we remember? You know, like, uh, you know, we, we, when we talk at funerals about people, things like that, we talk about the vacations, we show the albums that we have, but that's not really what makes a person. What makes a person are the things that they happen on, on the day-to-day, -day, right? The vacations and the special occasions and the bar mitzvahs and the brit milot and the weddings and all that stuff. Those are all great. Those are all great experiences that really highlight what, what, what a person's life is about. But none of those experiences mean anything if in the interim, in between those time periods, there isn't an, you know, a day-to-day -day closeness that is, that is being drawn between people. So you know, we have through our calendar, we have holidays. So we just got through Pesach. We're going to have Shavuot. These are very special days on our calendar, but they don't make up the essence of what it means to live a Jewish lifestyle. If a person's only coming to Bet Knesset and are only observing the holidays, but then in the interim, they're just doing nothing. So they're missing out on what the holidays are really about. It's meant to be a boost, a jolt, a recharge for the person to be able to handle what's going on in the middle, to go through those cornfields and to recognize and appreciate what Hashem is doing for us during those times. That's why I remember Rabbi Bold a few weeks ago, I think it was right before Pesach, he mentioned the idea that we don't say Hallel every single day. We don't say the big Hallel that we do every single day, only on special occasions. Why? Because that Hallel is all about the miracles that Hashem did, open miracles that Hashem did. But that's not what Hashem is ideal. Hashem doesn't want to perform open miracles for us. Hashem wants us to see him in the day-to-day -day experiences that we have. The sun rises, the sun sets, we go to work, we're successful in business, we take care of our kids, we handle. These are the things that the everyday occurrences that we have to be able to seek out and see Hashem. Sometimes we lose sight of it, so Hashem has to do something a little bit more out there for us to be reminded that He's, that he's there with us at all times. But that's why every single day we say Pesuke de Zimra, and we say Modim, and we thank Hashem for the day-to-day -day things that He does for us at all times. Every breath that a person takes, every experience that a person has day-to-day, -day, getting to work, coming home, having, all these things are happening to us from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So I think recognizing that as part of the Modim is essential to this, uh, to this idea. Yeah. The obvious question is, when you do Hazara, why don't you repeat just the Modim? Why don't you change it? So, so the modim de Rabbanan is an interesting concept, right? So basically what I think happened over here is the Hazan is going to go over the Amidah and repeat the Amidah as is normal uh, in order to fulfill the obligation of those who may not be fluent in prayer, which means that those people would need to listen to the Beracha of the Hazan and respond to his Beracha. However, the rabbis saw that if the Hazan is thanking Hashem publicly out loud, and everybody else is quiet, it's almost as if the people are not willing to join in and thank Hashem and recognize him together with the Hazan. So the rabbi said it's impossible for us to allow the Kahal to be silent while one person, the Hazan, is publicly thanking Hashem. Everybody has to join in and publicly thank Hashem together with the Hazan. At the same time, the rabbis, I think, said, but we can't have everybody say the same Beracha that they said in the silent Amidah together with the Hazan because that would undermine the unique aspect of the Hazara. So the rabbi said, we want everybody to join in in thanking Hashem, but we can't have them thank Hashem in the same manner as the Hazan is doing publicly for those people who didn't pray. So the rabbis formulated a special modim prayer that is different than what we say in the silent Amidah in order to once again thank Hashem and join in in the thanks so that we're not quiet, but also we're still separate from what the Hazan is saying on behalf of the other people who need it. Yeah, asking, something. asking for something and thanking, I think, are different. I think the rabbis saw the quality of thanking Hashem cannot go while one person is doing it and everyone is silent, right? 
That's why, going back to Birkata Gomel, what did the rabbis do? There's, there's not just one person says the Beracha, everybody answers Amen. After the person answers Amen, there's a prayer that everybody else has to say, right? We have to respond. After we say Amen, we say Ha'el Asher Gemalecha Kol Tuv, the God who gave you all of this kindness, who you Gemolcha Kol Tuv Sela, he should continue to give you all of that kindness moving forward. Why did the rabbis make a response to this Beracha? We don't have that. Person uh, picks up an apple, picks up a coffee, makes a Beracha. There's just, just say Amen and move on. There's no response back to that. The rabbis, I think, had to make a response because they understood if one person thanks Hashem in a public way for something that he did, the rest of the people can't just answer amen. They have to chime in. They have to respond with some kind of a blessing, some kind of an acknowledgement beyond just the standard amen to the fact that a person is publicly acknowledging the greatness and the kindness that Hashem has performed for him. So when you get together with people at a se'udat hoda'ar, a meal of thanks for Hashem, it's not enough for just that person to thank Hashem. Everybody has to come together and do it as well because it's a public acknowledgement of Hashem. That's the power of, uh, of gratitude and thanks over here. It's not a coincidence. That's why we have bowing at the beginning of this, uh, at the beginning of this beracha. We only had bowing at the beginning of the Amida, at the very first beracha. And now all of a sudden in this beracha, in acknowledging and thanking Hashem, we have bowing at the beginning and at the end. At the words modim we bow and at the beracha we bow as well to, I think, emphasize the importance of this beracha even more so than some of the berachot that we had prior to this. Right. Yeah. Do they always bow? I mean, there's, no, there's nothing in the Siddur that says, you know, bow, you know, bow. Like, do they always do it? They always did it. The Gemara discusses the evolution of bowing and how they did it and at what stages they did it. The Gemara comes to the conclusion that it's inappropriate for a person to be consistently bowing throughout his Amidah, especially at the beginning and conclusion of each beracha, they looked at that as maybe uh, overly, uh, you know, zealous of bowing to Hashem, right? As maybe like a yohara, like a religious arrogance to bow before God that many times. So the rabbis established that a person only bows at the beginning and end of the first beracha and at the beginning of the end of this beracha. That's it. Those are the times that a person has to acknowledge uh, Hashem. And I think that they established this beracha over here in Modim because of the severity of thanking Hashem and what it means to us and acknowledging Hashem at that point. Rabbi Sachs also brings down that the shoresh, the root of hoda'a, toda, yud dalid hey, in many, in Aramaic actually means to bow. And so that's why we bow by the case of modim. Additionally, it means to admit, to profess. So we're admitting that Hashem, our life hangs in your hands, that we're nothing without your miracles, etc. And of course, we're giving thanks to Hashem for those things as well. That Amban writes a powerful idea. He says, we put on tefillin every single day. Why do we put on tefillin every single day? In our tefillin, it recalls the great miracles that Hashem performed for us when he took us out of Mitzrayim. So the question we invariably always get is, Hashem, a, a God, a Rabbi, why doesn't God just do miracles for us all the time, right? How many teenagers come, Rabbi, if, the, if Hashem didn't open miracle for me, I'd believe in Hashem. I want to see something crazy happen then I believe in Hashem. Of course, the people who left Mitzrayim believed in Hashem. Look at all of the great miracles that happened for them, right? And there are no miracles happened for me, so why should I believe in Hashem? So first of all, if you know anything about psychology, it's exactly the opposite. The generation that left Mitzrayim, who had so many miracles performed for them, had trouble believing in Hashem. They struggled. I mean, they were a generation on a tremendous level, but they, cha they were challenged to believe in Hashem consistently because when a person sees open miracles, it doesn't necessarily change their mind about Hashem's existence. They go back the next day, right back to, to where they were. In fact, we often see the opposite, that if a person is only hinging himself on miracles and Hashem showing their hand, their belief system is often weak because they're forcing Hashem to do something for them. Otherwise, they won't believe. The Ramban says, Hashem did a thing once, once in, a, in, a, in, a, in the lifetime, once in the world's existence to show his hand to such an extent. We then capture that idea in our tefillin and we wear it every single day to remind us that everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does for us on a daily basis is a miracle. Everything that Hashem does to assist us is coming directly from Him and something that we have to thank Hashem for. And when a person comes to the belief in Hashem through nature, through the everyday, that's the highest level of emunah. That's the highest level of belief and trust that a person can have in Hashem. If it's based on miracles, it's incredibly weak. If it's based on a person understanding that everything happens from Hashem, then it's much stronger. So this beracha, I think, in addition to thanking Hashem and appreciating Hashem, also hits to the core of our emunah, of our belief in Hashem, 
that everything that happens on a daily basis is coming from him and deserves us to acknowledge Hashem for the day in and day out occurrences that Hashem is performing on our behalf. Baruch Adonai Amen, amen.